All right, so on this week's episode of OBF Unplugged, I have Dr. Phil Price on the show. Welcome to the show, Phil. Hey, mate. You are right? I'm good now, and you? No, very, very well. Very good. Excellent. So I first met Phil uh, two years ago now, I believe, in St. Mary's in Twickenham, and it was after your presentation in which I, um, I just made contact with you when we had a, a, a really good chat. It was a phenomenal presentation in terms of how you put it across, how you linked it all together, and how you finished with your case study. I, it was just, it was just, <laughs> it, 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 yeah, it resonated deeply because I felt that we had a lot of, uh, a lot of commonalities in our thinking. So, um, mm. Phil, welcome to the show, as I've said already. Could you give the, the listeners uh, or my audience a little bit of a background on yourself and your education? Uh, cool. Um, so, yeah, I'm a, uh, lecturer senior lecturer at St Mary's University so I predominantly teach on the S&C degrees that they have there so that I'm more on the undergraduate degree but uh, I also do a lot of stuff on the um, uh, dissertation supervising on the MSc as well and with the amount of courses that we're starting to bring out you know, I'm teaching on more and more which is really quite nice because it adds well it gives me a chance to really think about what I want to do and um, you know, how I process my information, try and deliver it to everyone. Um, so yeah, I've been teaching there for over 10 years now. Um, funny enough, I actually started teaching there as a graduate assistant. So I was only part-time teaching on sort of year, first year, second year on the undergraduate degree while I was just finishing off my master's. So we've done the same master's. Okay. Um, and then once I've done that, I, <laughs> the university said, well, we want to keep you on. We like your, your teaching that you're doing here. Uh, but uh, if you don't want to do a PhD, we're not going to renew your contract. And luckily for me, I, I, I liked the research side of things. Uh, I liked that critical thinking side of things. So that was a no brainer for me. I wanted to stay on and do a PhD anyway. So I, you know, stayed on my grad assistant role um, while doing the PhD. Uh, but fortunate for me, I managed to land a lecturing role there quite quickly. Um, <clears throat> so I was doing my PhD alongside um, teaching full time and just um, been doing that ever since. Um, my research areas are quite broad at the moment. So my, my PhD is actually uh, was in bioengineering. So I was supervised by uh, Dr. Dan Clether, who you know quite well, who's the, the program director of the Masters in SNC. And he, for his PhD, developed a musculoskeletal model of the knee, which kind of uh, makes estimates and calculates what it thinks is going on in the knee. So either the forces between the joint or the forces that the muscles create to create movement. Um, and I wanted to put that into practice. Uh, at the time, you know, it was an umming eye which direction that you wanted to take it, because that could be quite broad with the knee. Uh, and I went a bit more of a health way with it. Uh, I actually used it with osteoarthritis patients. Um, but since, since I've actually finished my degree, my research has broadened a little bit. Because whenever I think about like, research that interests me, it always seems to be around the lower limb. Uh, and you know, I've got the performance side, I've got the, the injury side, and the, you know, trying to understand it from a, like, a mathematical perspective. Um, so that's kind of the areas that that particular area is going. Uh, I've joined a few sort of research groups, which have been quite interesting, quite varied. So I'm on the PhD team for two SNC coaches that are ones at the Royal Ballet and ones at the Royal Ballet School. So we're looking at uh, kinematics and kinetics of uh, jump landings uh, for one of them. And the other one, we're going to look at something similar, but more from a screening point of view uh, and seeing if um, maturation has a big effect on those types of issues. Uh, I'm also doing a bit of work with um, some uh, friends who were working at England Sevens. Uh, so looking at how sort of vertical jump data actually changes throughout the season. Uh, so we're working on that at the moment. And thirdly, which I'm really quite excited about, is, I don't know if you've seen on my Instagram, uh, we got in contact with someone that's created uh, like a, a supine sled exercise device. Um, where the idea behind it is it's kind of like a Pilates machine but the idea behind it is that it will enable um, astronauts to be able to jump in space so I think people are quite familiar with um, you know when you go into space 
you're in weightlessness so there's no gravity acting you so your bones and your muscles tend to decrease in size and strength and that's a real problem once you get back down to earth and need to pull yourself out of the ship because it's gone into the water um so the idea is to try and understand if we can actually get this uh piece of equipment to be really just as effective in weightlessness and weight or microgravity as it is on, on the earth's surface so um that's a really exciting project because that's funded by the uk and european space agency um and if we are successful like the steps leading to investigating it means that we need to uh do testing you know in the sh uh, the planes which they suddenly drop and it yeah. great, creates microgravity in the in the earth's atmosphere so we've got to test it in that so like fingers crossed it all goes through um because i wouldn't mind doing that but <laughs> you probably only have a few opportunities because it's really expensive and i can't enjoy just floating around because i've got to be working with the equipment or jumping so <laughs> but either way that's a really exciting project that that is being developed at the moment as well so those are kind of kind of my research areas um so yeah quite <laughs> quite there's varied at the moment yeah there's a lot of variety in research there isn't there yeah I, I i prefer it that way you get a lot of researchers that seem to find their niche and then they become like real expert in it um i think in the grand scheme of things i'm still quite early on in the sort of academic career because my phd i finished two years ago so i would have thought you start broad before narrowing down but mm. I think that's one of the beauties of working at St. Mary's. You know, technically, my full-time job is a teacher and I do research around it. Um, so I have a bit more of a control of the directions I want to take that research. Whereas if you're at another university where you're on a research contract, it's like, okay, you need to publish this much. Uh, you know, you, you're being held to certain benchmarks. And if you don't get it, you know, what does that mean to your contract? Yes. Um, so I think that's when people get really niche is because their contracts force in a certain direction. Yes. Um, uh, I mean, I've never been in that situation. So I wonder what happens to your creativity when you're being looked down on to achieve certain benchmarks. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I like, I like the direction everything's going at the moment. Let's say, let's say that. <laughs> and, and you do some practical applied coaching as well, don't you? Yeah. So I kind of I run a, a bit of a um, coaching physio sort of mini business as a, what do they call them? Side hustles. Yeah. Um, let's call it that. So my wife is a physio uh, and I run more the physical training side of things. So I, <clears throat> I do coach three to four uh, people as well. But um, the main thing I like about the coaching is, you know, I'm talking about ideas constantly when, teaching s and c uh, and researching it and i want that opportunity to put it into practice mm. see if i'm right see if i'm wrong you know that's the best way for questions to come about i think um so you know i, I don't want to be one of those researchers that's not doing anything applied i know there's the whole you know popular skin in the game quotes at the moment mm. um but it's it's more to just help me creative creatively um, if I don't have that opportunity, I, then the questions don't get presented to me. Um, and then my understanding doesn't go as well. Um, also, I actually just started a project with a friend of mine called Progress Theory. We actually um, have started a pro uh, podcast with it and a bit of a YouTube channel as well. Okay. The idea behind that was um, we have a particular challenge uh, and we're going to train for this challenge in, say, eight weeks and we're gonna i'm gonna document all the programming that we're doing and then each episode leading up to that challenge we focus on a different area where we present the like scientific rationale behind the program uh and i wanted a very transparent way of showing off okay here's what the science says here's what practical experience says here's what's being presented by the sport and by the athlete how are we making decisions um so it's it's seeing all of this in, in, in an applied way i like that um, yeah yeah so the one we just did uh, our challenge is i've got to run 5k in 20 minutes he's got to run 10k in 40. Um, i'm not a good runner so that's quite a big ask in eight, eight weeks so the one we just did was on uh what was the running uh programming that we did 
before was like determinants of running performance. Then that was running uh, volumes, intensities, all that sort of thing. How we, how we program that. Uh, the next one we're going to do is more like the S and C side of things. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it, I'm, really, I'm really excited about it because yeah, very one, it puts my ideas out there um, and these ideas could be wrong. So I'd like to think it opens it up for crit critique. Like everything we're doing has some kind of rationale behind it. But until you do it, you don't know that it's going to work. Yeah. So um, it's a way of documenting it. It's like putting it out for peer review. Um, and hopefully... I'd like a, like a podcast episode where we reflect on what happens, you know, did we do this right, did we do this wrong? Oh, someone picked up a niggle. Was that because of the programming or were we just unlucky? Uh, it just provides opportunities for questions. Um, uh, and I need that to help my creative side, I think. Otherwise, you, I might get bored. Are you going to edit it down to like a 30-minute show or is it going to be a series on the one topic for X amount of weeks? Uh, so at the moment, we've got... Each podcast is around 45 minutes to an hour. Okay. Uh, and then the actual event or the challenge, we're going to film in like a vlog style and then just okay. put it together. Uh, so we would like, like season one is like four podcasts and a little video. And then season two with the next challenge where we four podcasts and the video and just go from like that. So hopefully we can be quite creative with the challenges. Um, you never know, it might take us abroad or anything like that because um, I'd like each challenge to have a theme so for example one theme might be altitude the next one might be heat the next one might be uh, cold or whatever it might be and it's kind of like a, a bit of a sports science show um, but uh, yeah we chose the first one of, um, of 5k and 10k because we thought that people might relate to it yeah. um, we can't do too much at the moment because because um, <laughs> of covid uh, that's something where we can definitely know we have access to training uh, or equipment to training. Um, uh, my access to equipment is much different to his. So then all of a sudden we've got a discussion point. It's like, okay, we're two different people. How much is that determining what the SNC is like? Or is it equipment availability? Uh, or is it one of those things where you have a heavy squat rack? Are you putting too much emphasis on the heavy squat work because it's there? <laughs> uh, you know, lots of different questions which we were hoping to delve into. So, yeah, yeah. that's quite exciting to say. And what's in the end of it again? Uh, progress theory. Progress theory. I did realise you were doing that when I looked it up. Yeah, so it's only just it started. We've got like three, three episodes in. The first one was a, a pilot because um, my friend uh, walked up and down his parents' staircase uh, at the height of the stratosphere it took him 46 hours um, and you think oh it's just walking upstairs d d d how hard can it be but if you're doing it for that long like I think it really uh, it knocked him for six for at least a week and a half afterwards um, okay so, so, so just to reiterate that he walked up and down his parents stairs consistently for 46 hours and I think he had the, the odd break okay over that time Right. Um, I don't know what his actual overall moving time was, but uh, to reach, because it was a, a stratosphere is about 10k uh, above the Earth's surface. So I think, I think it was like 2,863, something like that. That's how many times he had to go up and down his, these stairs. And he said the worst bit was his feet. It's like my feet just started cramping. Um, he was like worried about his knees, his hips. He's like, nope, my feet just really, really hurt. Um, so yeah that's that is um that's a that's a task isn't it mm. yeah i'm glad he did that on his own but that's how the the project got started because um he was thinking about he did a double marathon running around his garden okay uh and funny enough while he was doing that he was leaving me voice notes because he was teaching me about american football uh, and then when he thought about this walking upstairs he was like is there is it how big of a task is this maybe i should ask someone so he phoned me up and then we just got this chatting about like all the different things he needs to consider and we like we just said to each other like this is really good fun why don't we make this into a bit of a more permanent thing like a bit of a series and it's developed from that so you never know where these projects might go you know they're they're, they're fun but at, uh, you know it could go anywhere so that's what's exciting about it so yeah, it's really enjoyable 
Yeah, it definitely has the um, it definitely has the capacity to go anywhere because it's a great idea. It really is to document and it's appealable. You know what I mean? There's um, to the five and ten k thing. So, what is your five k time at the moment? You're trying to peel it down to twenty. Where are you? Yeah, I was at twenty one fifty five. So, <laughs> quite a long way to go. Um, unless I drastically lose weight, then I might be able to bounce my way along quick enough. Um, so yeah, but you're, you're you're lean as it is, well, relatively lean, but a bit yeah. of a bit of a lump. It's just um, so I've had four knee surgeries. Yes, and, uh, and funny enough, one of the lectures I gave to our masters in sports rehab, I I I did I go with the title in the end? The title I originally gave it was "What I've Learned from Having Shit Knees," um, but the idea behind it was to discuss my rehab I did with both my ACL ruptures and where I think I went wrong mm-hmm. because I, you know I'm back running I can do pretty much everything but I don't think I you know when you reflect you know hindsight is a lovely thing isn't it I look back at it and I think I would have done this differently I would have done this differently and I'm thinking well these are the stories I should try and get out to students because one they could either disagree with me or two that might make them reflect on any type of like rehabilitation programs that they've written. Um, so that's how I try to uh, structure that particular lecture. And I think it went quite well. Maybe it was because, again, we were talking about this earlier, wasn't there? As long as there's mm-hmm. a, like a decent story of what you're trying to say, it becomes it's easier for people to resonate with it because they then apply it in their own way rather than you should do this because of this. Um, uh, you know, a, a lot of the things I talked about was trying to think of, I think I over emphasize strength, uh, certainly absolute strength. It's easy to track, isn't it? You know, certain numbers on a barbell, for example, uh, I didn't focus enough on what I like to think of drills that enhance, um, sort of relaxation. So many types of sprint drills where, you know, the muscles have to work really suddenly, often eccentrically, and then switch off to allow uh, movement of the limb to be really fast. I really didn't work on that enough. So even as I was going through the later stages of uh, the ACL rehab, like my muscles just wanted to be on all the time. I was so stiff and how I solve problems, especially with agility or something like that. Uh, I I just think I, I didn't, I focused too much on qualities and not enough on others. So those are the, the types, of, uh, types of information I wanted to get out to the students. Okay, very good. Very good. And, and another thing I spoke to Joseph Kine about last week, and he made the distinction between like, evidence-based and literature-based. You know, and, like, there can be something in, you know, something that a coach has done for 20 years, and his success would be evidence enough for him to you know what I mean, base his decision on his programming. And... Mm-hmm the differentiation between evidence-based and something that's actually scientifically research or literature-based. And then he made a, a very clear distinction between both. I'd love to get your like, thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of agree with his, with his ideas, really. I think a lot of the time, when it comes to sort of the literature, the literature's proving what we already know or it's given us a bit more of an understanding of what we know to be true because of results that are happening in training. Um, so I've never really differentiated between evidence-based and literature-based, but that's a really quite nice way of differentiating the two. Mm-hmm. And probably another reason why I, I want to keep coaching and training and do all those things, because if I'm formulating questions, it's something I'm doing, um, whether I'm doing it enough to qualify it as evidence-based, uh, I don't know, but it's generating ideas that you then could put it into a dissertation, for example, that gets published and that's literature based. But that came from playing around and just developing evidence in a, in a coaching environment. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure there's quite a few things that are becoming popular, even on, uh, on let's say, social media. And like, I would always look at something and I wouldn't say, oh, what is that rubbish? What's the literature say? I was like, well, that's interesting. What does the literature say? <laughs> I, think there's a, I think there's a big difference between the two because it could work. We just don't know. Um, there must be some kind of rationale why that person's doing it. Uh, you know, if it's been working for them for a certain amount of years, 
you know, what's to say that the literature won't agree with it uh, if they didn't investigate it properly. So, yeah. um, it's not for me to say that the literature is behind, but literature, you know, to actually collect data, analyze it, write it, go through a peer review process, that takes a while. Yeah. So, you know, it's not, you're going to wait for the, the papers to say yes before you continue doing something which you believe to be right. Like you're not going to, but it's nice for that research to happen. So that means it can add to your understanding of what you were doing before and then will lead to more questions happening. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I have this nice idea. I have this, this image of a continuum in my own mind, just when I'm always reviewing my own coaching process. And, you know, at one end of the continuum, you have, you know, research based, evidence based, the first principles of what you know you think is true, or even, you know, so that grounds an awful lot of your decisions. But then on the other end of the continuum, polar opposite to that is your intuition. And you know, what your experience has told you, what your gut tells you. And what I often find myself grappling with is trying to establish my biased blind spots and what am I biased towards. And an example, and this is kind of ties into the conversation we're going to have. Like I think possibly one of the biggest drawbacks to formal education is you are educated what the institution wants you to know. So if the institution really values Olympic lifting, then you go through the process of learning the Olympic lifts, demonstrating, coaching, and so forth over a period of time. So therefore, through that process, through the virtue of time, experience, and hours put in, you will or you should get good at coaching the Olympic lifts. So then when it comes to your programming, because of the fact that you're good at coaching them, you will establish some bias subconsciously towards the Olympic lifts because you know all the benefits of the Olympic lifts and you can start to um, rig all that stuff off. So then when you see an athlete, sometimes you make that exercise fit the athlete as opposed to assessing the human in front of you first. So to me, that there's a little bit of bias at play there, right? So when I have this continuum of evidence base versus intuition and where my bias sits, this is just a mental model I have in my own head as well, by the way, so it's kind of hard yeah. to articulate that across. Um, would you look at it like that? Is that something that you've kind of looked at? Have you um, have a global framework in your own mind of where things sit? Because somewhere in the middle of all that then is cognitive dissonance, and you know what I mean? You, you, you know, you could be stifled by indecision based around the fact that you need everything to be, to be based in literature. And if you were to wait for everything to be based in, in evidence, then you'd never make a decision and you would be totally and utterly stifled mm. in your coaching practice. Mm. I mean, yeah. Um, <clears throat> whenever I think about, okay, what is the aim? for everyone that's going through, let's say the undergraduate degree, is you'd want them to be able to use what you described, your intuition, things you're seeing in front of you in, the, uh, in your experience, uh, and the literature, for example, on that continuum. And then you gauge where you are on that continuum based on what's happening in front of you, based on the athlete, based on the situation. Whereas I would hate it to think that someone's going to be very rigid on that continuum and approach be on that continuum for every situation just because that's where they feel comfortable and if they feel comfortable it's probably because that's where most of their learning has been um so yeah i think all coaches for example need to be quite flexible on that continuum because you don't know what the situation is going to provide there could be it could be situations where you completely ignore the, the literature that's supporting a certain way of doing things. Like this, in this situation with this athlete, that's not going to work. So I would hate to think that um, a coach would, would not or be scared to do that because he thinks, oh, yeah, but this says this, so I must follow it. Like, no, it's there to guide. Um, I, th I think <clears throat> from university courses trying to make sure that we try and hit certain targets and that target might be we want someone to be very good so they pass the UKSA accreditation process sometimes that may lead to you know certain emphasis on certain topics and funny you should say that it's the Olympic lifting 
because I'm sure when I was getting into uh, S&C, starting to teach it, like it was so heavily promoted from the UKSCA, Olympic lifting, that everyone started to do it. And if, I, if I'm brutally honest of how I was when I was um, sort of maybe halfway through my master's, like I think I was very um, sort of biased towards the Olympic lifts, very much so. And that's because we learned a lot of it. Uh, and I weight lifted myself. And I've seen so many uh, instances where you've got a coach which uses a lot of weightlifting derivatives in, its, in their programming because they like and practice weightlifting. And then you've got others that are oh, hate weightlifting, then all of a sudden they don't really program it. Like it's a tool which you can use if you wish. That's, that's essentially what it is. You, you know what you need to get out of your athletes and that's one way of doing things. Um, so always have that available to you if you need it. And I mean, not just weightlifting, I'd like to think that the university, especially at undergraduate level, teaches the rationale behind certain techniques, certain methods, and never once says, oh, you should do this. It's because I'd want them, the, the student to think for themselves and think, okay, I might use this for this situation rather than, okay, you know, if we started uh, producing students or SNC coaches that have finished their third year and they're all very similar in their approach, like to me, that means we failed as a degree because we haven't taught that ability to think individually and think critically. Mm. So if we get to the end of it and they provide a presentation of their like personal philosophy of S and C and their different types of strategies, I'd like to think it's an amalgamation of everything they've learned during those three years and loads and loads of coaching and put it into practice in different situations outside of the degree. Then so you've got this S and C identity, um, which is you'd like to think is going to be very flexible. So yeah, I mean certainly we want them to be you know, utilize or be on that continuum. But I'd hope that by the end of the three years that they'll be able to move along that continuum with, with ease uh, based on what's been presented to them by athlete, business or whatever it might be. Yeah, it, it, it definitely will allow you to bridge the gap between academia and where the rubber meets the road in coaching. Like I remember... You know, you, you could do your four-year undergrad, you could learn the technical model of X, Y, and Z, and then you find yourself in a dressing room with 25 part-time GA players, and you realize, okay, well, an awful lot of what I learned here isn't going to cut it because these guys think I'm an asshole to start with because I'm using words that they can't relate to. And, you know what I mean, I'm not going to use language like kinematics and kin kinetics and so forth. They just want to play ball because that's mm -hmm. the sport they love. And I think th that's probably another big issue as well. Like, I always say this, that if the athlete is getting more excited about my gym sessions than they are about playing the sport, then I have a problem because all I'm trying to do is uh, give them the gift to play the sport at a higher level. Okay, So build whatever capacities or skills to allow them or at least just to give them the ability to spend more time in the field and perform at a higher level. And I often found this that, you know, the lads could buffer a really bad game on a Saturday or a Sunday by a good gym session on a Monday night. And all of a sudden the gym is becoming a safe space for the athlete. And there's no measurable consequence of having a bad day at the gym, but there is a measurable consequence to having a bad game on a Sunday. And that consequence is a scoreboard. So I think that as an SNC coach, having that awareness around where, what our role is, and where we fit within the the athletes the athletes development and overall plan as well is really important mm. no yeah it's certainly i i wonder what your take on this actually is because i've always thought that the role of a university is very similar to the role of an, uh, an snc coach um so say you've got someone that's coming at school and wants to work in elite sport and I see that as like a continuum and you know you do a lot of different things along the way but I always think that university is seen as something you get like a say you got like this work placement this 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 
university is something that you go through, but really university is just the side add-on to help you develop certain skills along that way. It's not like you pass through it because it's the be all end all to, to be a, a certain coach. Uh, and I often see the similarities between an S and C coach, like the athlete to be at the top level needs to become the best at that particular sport. And S and C is that little add on, which is good to supplement. They are learning as an athlete physically and mentally and tactically to get to where they want to be. So I, I see them as, as quite different. And when you get that, uh, when you perceive them in those ways, I think that's when they're used most effectively. Um, I think a lot of that has also come from when it comes from a university perspective. Uh, every first lecture we have with the students, um, we say, uh, you need to do a lot of work experience to really put these principles that you learn here into practice. Um, and they're, you know, fresh face out of, you know, doing A-levels. And then you get to like second, the third year where we are advertising really good work placements at a time where this is the time where you should be doing work placements, you know, it's because there's you know, links to uh, university credit. Uh, and we're struggling to get people applying for really good ones with like professional teams, all that sort of thing. So there's always a, di a disconnect, I think. People think like, if I do this degree, that means I'm ready at the end of it to be whatever you want to be. It's like, no, this degree is the add-on. Yeah. You need to, if you want to be a, a, an SNC coach, you need to be being an SNC coach, whether it be placements, working one-on-one -on -one with, uh, you know, your brother, because they play tennis at the weekend. Like, it's all good experience. Um, so, so yeah. And but because the idea with university, you can go on and do any uh career in sport technically isn't geared to just being an s c coach you know working with lots of different populations you know if you're already working roughly in the in the direction that you want to go having that as an add-on is just going to emphasize this rather than you know being all of it and then distracting you from what you actually want to be after after university um so <laughs> yeah i mean if we can get more and more students doing work placements and the, the the good students do and they come away looking incredible but there is for certain students maybe the ones that are uh coming straight out there's more chance of it if they've come straight out of a levels yeah. um maybe because they're not really sure what they want to do when they when they finish university uh there's a bit of a disconnect of like they get to the end of third year and like right i need a work placement it's like, no, you should have been doing that first, second year. You know, practice what you preach, what we've been, you know, talking about in these lectures. That's the opportune time to actually figure it out. Okay. You know? and, and it actually leads me into a question that just popped into my head. In your experience in lecturing, have you noticed that the people who come back as mature students, i.e. they might have five or six years practical experience as even PTs or have worked within a gym setting, how do you find that they apply themselves to the academic side of things, to someone who's come straight out of A-level? Uh, much better. Okay. Much, much better. To the point, this doesn't always work out that way, but I would be more inclined to let someone in the course that might not, say they're 23, uh, but love powerlifting, I don't know. They love powerlifting and they love learning about it, but it's not their full-time job. They work in IT in some way, but they want to have a change in career. So they come to university because they love powerlifting. That to me, they will be much better to take on a university degree in general than someone that's straight out of university, uh, straight out of A-levels because they've been in, in the world and they've been fed lots of different types of information so their ability to process lots of different types of information is much better. And that's just happened naturally from going to work. So then all of a sudden they come to university and think, Oh, have they, you know, will they have the ability to write academically? Well, yeah, they'll learn, we'll teach them. But because they've been out and can deal with sort of stresses of the real world, they're more in a better position to, to learn it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I, I do feel, and this isn't a slight at all against, uh, teachers that work in FE uh, or, um, you know, GCSE level, but there's real element of spoon feeding 
Mm. And I, I really don't think it's the teacher's fault. I think they are, they get hammered with the notion that they need to pass. I've even had someone that used to work in FE saying we weren't allowed to fail anyone. It doesn't matter how bad it was. We needed to, to almost do their work to make sure that they passed. And that's, that's awful. Like it, it then means that you've got all these students are like, Oh, I, I prefer coursework. So of course you do because you've got opportunities to get feedback from your lecturers about four or five times before you hand it in. Like it, all of a sudden it's their work, not yours. Um, so you know, making lecturers do that is really stressful for them, but also doesn't give the student opportunity to sort of learn on the feedback that they should be giving. Um, so then when it comes to university where it's much more independent, they struggle. They're like, oh, I feel a bit lost. It's because they haven't had that uh, spoon feeding, hand holding. Um, so when it comes to, yeah, that versus like a PT who's been working as a PT for 15 years, who really wants to work in SSE, it almost becomes not the fact they've been working in a gym, it's just because they are much better at dealing with information um, and can have the ability to learn. Well, there's a better chance that they have the ability to learn. Whereas I think we're taking that opportunity away from younger students, uh, younger children going through like A levels and stuff. Yeah. Um, there, there's, I, I listened to a great, TED talk the other day by Ken Robinson where the and it's probably quite true in university level as well but the, the the exams become the dominant culture of education and it shouldn't be they just should be there diagnostically to see how someone's getting on so if that becomes the, the dominant um, culture then everything's geared towards that so you're you're learning to pass the test rather than learning to learn and then when you get moved into an environment where we want to encourage learning to learn they they struggle um so you know it'd be great to have you got me talking from like a university experience it'd be great to have someone at the same in, in this podcast as well that teaches in further education someone that teaches at dcse level and go they might completely disagree with me but that's the kind of perception i'm getting yeah. Um, and it's yeah well like I, I think I was it was it Einstein said that education is what you get when you forgot everything you learned was that, was that an Einstein quote education? it might have been yeah. there might be a lot of quotes that get attributed to Einstein, Einstein yeah, so, I think, think Elon Musk has said something similar as well yeah um, about education um, yeah which is which is a real shame this I mean self-improvement or to a point learning is so popular right now. And I think it's because everyone's reached like, you know, the mid twenties and they are starting to figure out how they learn. Then they're like, Oh, because I can learn, I can then apply it to that. I can then apply it to that. Um, whereas, you know, that ability to learn how you learn takes a long time and you might not have learned it by 18. I think I only started really understanding my way of learning until I was 21. I'd say, which, you know, I've already done two thirds of my degree by that point. And yeah. I was like, Oh, okay. I've been missing a trick here. Um, so yeah, I mean, th that's what makes it different and uh, difficult. And I wonder if that actually plays into why so many people are changing careers. I mean, I think we're as humans, we, we, you know, we get bored and want to try something new, but at the same time, when you all of a sudden get these new experiences and all these new skills, you want to apply in a new area that provides passion for you. Mm -hmm. So people are changing degree, uh, changing, um, uh, changing career paths, which is quite exciting. Mm -hmm. So it's then like, okay, if that's the, is that the question, how can we create an environment where people can learn how to learn themselves? Yes. yes. That should be the aim. And I've actually written down a question here because, I, as I say it, everyone like I don't have pre-designed questions, but I just have. As you talk, I'm writing down like, and I always saw, like in my experience of education, failure was always kind of an isolating experience, right? So when I was in, um, what we have is our leaving cert here, okay? So when I was in secondary school here, if I ever got an F, it was it was. I never went out to fail. No one ever goes out to fail in education, right? But it's part of, I don't want to use the word the process, right? But it's part of the journey, especially if you're working at a level or if you're doing something that 
you're outside of your comfort zone, then failure is inevitable. It's going to happen. And then what I always felt was you have an honors and a pass grade. And if you went to honors and you failed, well, then you automatically went down to pass. Okay, so it was like, that's the end of the time at honors. You now go down a level and you just go straight into pass. And it was never, there was never teaching around, okay, how do I reflect? How do I learn? How do I deal with this failure? And how do I progress so I can stay at this honors level and get better? It was always a case of, no, you just drop down a grade. And if you're an F at honors, you'll be an, automatically, an automatic B or a C grade at pass. And you'll just tip away when you're down there. Does that make sense? And like from a player standpoint, because you drew a parallel between academia and players a while ago, you know, dealing with failure on the field is something that, it's, again, it's inevitable because of the nature of team sport. And you're reaching and repeating at the, at the edge of your ability, right? So the failure process with athletes we're always looking at actions decisions and behaviors and it's a reflective process around that right so how do you think and i know this is a big question now how do you think we can apply this in academia yeah um, it's a tricky one um i've always tried to understand like what do you th i think is going to reflect that person best and if I give that reflection how are they going to then use that to then reflect themselves so I, I've always this is a personal opinion I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer here but I've always hated giving marks because I'll write down all the feedback and then I have like a mark and I, a lot of these things were especially as with a like maybe a third year student that you've seen develop you're like, I can't wait for them to see this feedback because they're really improving. I want them to improve even more. I think they're at this level, but I think they can get here. And if they make these tweets, they could get there. And then you put a mark to it. And that mark then either works in certain ways. One, the student then looks at it and goes, oh, I've got that. Oh, I'm not happy with that. Ignore, ignores the feedback. Um, they either look at the mark and then go, it puts them in a bad mood. So then they look at the feedback and then they view it negatively, despite if you want to try and put a spin on it positively, like the positive, it's there to help you. And I'm always thinking like, what can I do to make them focus on what I think is going to make them better? Mm. And I've often like, ah, oh, I don't want to take assessments away because I think it's good working to a deadline. I think having the, stress of exams is can be seen in a real negative light but sometimes you know if you're in the real world you're working to deadlines you're working with people it's a stressful environment it, there's some transfer there um but i just don't like giving grades it's to the point where i'd rather give like um like a report on that person so the report would go over how they did in their assessments whether it be practical essay a feedback of how they could get better in those things and then it comes with a description of them as a person as well and how they apply themselves how they could maybe improve their learning and stuff like that um, I mean a lot of that has come from I've seen you have like a student that's really comes to every lecture really attentive ask good questions and then might get like a 65 so it's a you know a um, two one in that particular assessment or module and then you might have someone else that has a lot of potential but is quite lazy doesn't attend to much comes to the assessment and squeezes a 71 and you think okay if you if you're looking at employers they're going to see this and just going to think okay this guy this person's better because they got the higher mark but in my head i'm thinking well i want this person because they work hard, they're attentive, they may not be there at the moment, but that one mark is not showing where they could be next year or the year after. So having just something which describes the um, student, I think would be very beneficial. It's a bit like a report card without the assessment, uh, without the marks. Um, so I'd, I'd like to think, because it encompasses all the things that they've been doing throughout the module, the assessments and them as a person, that might, resonate more with them 
so that they re reflect more on the um, reflect more on the feedback, and hopefully that then helps with you know how they approach next next year or how they approach all the work placements outside of things, uh, that sort of thing. Um, I wonder if that helps in like a reflective type practice, which they may then take into their own learning. Um, I, I don't know if, I, if this doesn't happen with CS mature students and master students, but what I found is um, undergraduate students are more likely to not attend the practical seminars than the lectures, which to me seems really weird because you get them in the open days. So like, I, I, I like the practicals. That's how I learn. I'm not, I'm not like a, I'm, I'm not too academic. I prefer learning with my hands and interactive. I was like, yeah, that's, that's cool. But then we get less people turning up to the seminars, which I think is weird, but I think that's ingrained in their previous education, which is all lecture based. Mm. They think, all right, if I go and memorize what they said, I'll be able to do well at the, the, the assessments or in, or in that module and that should not be the way so I, I for that I think there just needs to be a culture change like we talk about it and we have the importance of both but I don't think it's perceived as important because of what we're seeing in the classroom so if there's a way to try and teach people how to learn and then apply it in sort of seminar practical base that are, are linked with a, uh, a topic that they're very passionate about, which might be training that might help people. It might help speed up the process of people learning how to learn. Um, and in that, I hope that does not stifle anyone's creativity. Mm. Um, but it's interesting because to me, what you said there in terms of how you would address that reflective process is to me, it, correlated very highly with how I would coach in the sense that so how you would teach and how I would coach would be quite similar in the sense that you are trying to appeal to the individual personality of that of that student mm. yeah certainly everyone's different and everyone complains are oh, teaching really difficult when you've got 50 people and there's they're all different learners I was like okay but let's maybe take a step back and try and help them learn in their own way. So however you deliver it, you try and appeal it to, you know, everyone can take what they can out of it. Um, more and more with co coaching, everyone's talking about taking a step back and allowing athletes to figure it out. And we should be doing the same with education. Mm. Um, practical seminars are really good for this, but again, we need to, I think as, as, teachers we need to do more to try and show make, make the students realize this because with an athlete they'll probably you know keep training and are they you know they learn instinctively um whereas i don't think students do that because in the practicals because they are they think they need to be told what to do so whenever i, I set a practical task like i want people just to be really quite creative in it it might take a lot longer but then, you know, let's say we're learning agility or uh, speed or anything like that. You go away and do a task um, and then you elaborate on the task and you just watch people and you do it yourself and you start thinking, I want people to have that process. Quite often, they'll, I'll say, go away and do this. They'll do it once and then they go, they just look at you. They expect it to be told if that was right or wrong. And that's the last thing I want. Um, I want you to... I want you to make mistakes, play around. Just that, that's where you're going to memorize, you know, different approaches or develop your own approach by doing that. Um, so, yeah. We and do that, it. Yeah, and that's where I think so many people are stifled in education because it's kind of ingrained culturally into us that a mistake is a fail. And if you, if you fail, it's something that's frowned upon. So therefore, people, it stifles creativity. It stifles individuality and we, and I'm not saying that we don't stick to technical models and I'm not saying that we don't attain to, uh, attain to best practice. Of course we do, or at least what we're being taught best practices. But my point is that if we are afraid to step outside the box and to expose ourselves, then we are just fitting in the, in the middle of the bell curve. Hmm. Can I ask, um, out of all your, um, 
education. What's the mark you remember most? No, that is a great question, right? And this is a true story. And I only thought back on this as I got older, okay? So when I was in national school, okay? So up to the age of 12, I had, I had spent some time in America because we had moved to America. I had went from three years education in America to education in Ireland. I was really athletic, but I had no time for education, okay? I didn't apply myself and I had a really bad experience with changing schools and, and so forth, okay? And I remember in sixth class, so I was just before I went into secondary school, our teacher would, he would grade us, there was 33 boys in the class, and he would grade us from one to 33, okay? And there was a blackboard in the class and there was a hinge on the blackboard and he would have just a table the whole way down and you had number one at the top and number 33 at the back, at the bottom. And he'd hinge out the blackboard for the whole class to see. And he we'd have our test on a Friday and some lads would go up a grade and someone would go down a mark. And I never got above 28 out of 33 in my class, right? And I remember that the most because that developed my perception of myself around education. My self-image and the image I had of myself was that I wasn't intelligent, that I was a poor learner and academically I was weak. And I brought that into the first three years of my secondary school um, life. And then I started to discover subjects that I really was passionate about, history, um, geography. And then I started learning and I went to do my undergrad. And I remember the day I started, the very first day I started my undergrad and I was sitting in the lecture hall with everyone else. And I remember thinking to myself, all these people got the same amount of points in their leaving cert as I did. So we are starting from a level playing field because we are all of the equal mm. intellectual pool, so to speak. And it was just like a weight came off my shoulders. And I didn't realize this until afterwards in my later life. And when I'd done my undergrad, I was top five in my class in my undergrad because I thought, right, all these people have the same ability as I am. So I'm going to put my hand up and ask a question because I now have the confidence among my peers to step outside of my comfort zone. So I think that that sixth class experience is still the experience that stands out most in my own mind. That's a really cool story. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly, well, it shows the, the power of the marks. Absolutely. The perception of learning, and that seemed to affect you um, for several years. Um, and it, yeah, it was only until much later where you felt like the perception that was originally there was wiped clean, that your real potential really came out. Yeah, and, and that was just about me having um, an awareness of myself as I got older and that when I could step back and objectively look at why I thought that way, why, why, why did I have that? And it was just a learned experience. I was just, it, it, I, what I got taught in national school was that I wasn't intelligent. Now I know that's not true now, but that was my perception at the time. So I left my first 14, 13 years, well, sorry, not 13 years, eight years of formal education. And what my biggest learning after those eight years was that I wasn't intelligent. So then I love sport. So I threw all my time into sport because I could see a very tangible, objective, progressive um, improvement with sport, but I couldn't see it from an academic standpoint. And I couldn't see it because I never stepped out of my comfort zone. And I was two different people. And you can call that like, you know, sporting athletic identity, whatever it was, my athletic identity and my academic identity were completely different. And how I behaved on a field, I was, you know, a leader on the field. I could communicate, I could speak from a place of authority. In the class, I couldn't put my hand up and ask a question because I felt like I was way out of my depth and I didn't want to be humiliated among my peers. And it's just, 
again, these things that we don't realize until we reflect later on in life. And now I love learning. We spoke like, I, I would look three to four hours a day, every day. I couldn't imagine my life without some form of education or academia or development. But it's amazing because I think now I have a better appreciation for it than I did back then. Mm. It, it, uh, what, I, what was great to hear, because um, I've always found when speaking to people, um, that whenever you ask you ask questions about their education and people sort of start to hint of where they found that change and it always seemed to come from some kind of negative experience now, that could have been like a grade or it could be that but almost to the point where that if that negative experience didn't happen would you be in the same position now um, and it's, it's the same for me like um, there were key, especially types of assessments where I've suddenly done really badly. And if I didn't perform really badly in those, I wouldn't have realized of what I could have done, like where my potential was. And it happened on the, on the masters. It happened in my PhD. Um, and the, the crazy thing is people perceive the marks you get, the be all and end all mm. in a way. Um, you need to get this mark if you want to progress to the next stage. You need to get this mark if you want to go to university here. You know, you need to get this mark if you want to go in this direction. Well, then, well, that just seems so weird when you think, overall, the best mark I ever got was when I scraped a pass because something went terribly wrong, um, and that led me to be better. So clearly, the worst mark was the best mark. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's such a weird paradox, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. I think uh, it'd be great if listeners would just like reflect, like, wh wh which is the mark I, th I value most? And I wonder if it would all come down to a negative experience. Yeah, it, it, it is actually very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of, like, f just for the listeners, would you have any tips on creating your own learning style? And I know that's, like, again, a very vague, loaded question, but, mm. like, learning is a skill in itself so would you have any tips on number one creating awareness around how you learn and two on just developing your own learning style just out of your own experience yeah i even tried to i was having like a jot down of ideas before this podcast and that was one of the things that um i started thinking to myself like what, what, what's my where have i found i've got better aside from the sort of the failure type of the thing where have i got better um and usually there's a light bulb moment where i'm like oh i'm doing that completely wrong okay i'll do it this way um if i not, don't think of like light bulb moments uh key things that have led to me personally developing very well seems to be coming through sort of engagement with others so everyone's seen that triangle haven't they where you've got like lectures is only like five percent of your learning the most the most where you learn most is teaching mm. and i've been very fortunate to be put in a position where i've been teaching for 10 years and I, I i attribute a lot of my learning style and learning ability to that um so when i was developing my own learning style especially during my a levels um like i could recite the textbook but what i would do was i would make my own notes but the notes were just like a bite-sized version of the textbook and then i would reread my notes so i was just memorizing the textbook i wasn't actually learning it so when it came to short answer questions because they were quite similar what is this what is that uh, i would do well when it came to questions in the exam with a little bit more outside the box you got to think a little bit more and the, the questions are require a bit of a longer answer i wouldn't do as well so I knew the content, but I didn't really know it because I just memorized certain content. So if all of education was multiple choice quizzes, I probably would have done better early on, but I'm glad it isn't because then I wouldn't have realized how bad I was at learning. Um, and then when it came to my writing style, I seem to be better with numbers than words. Um, my writing style came because I was lucky enough to get a module uh, when I started working where it was the um, first essay that the students would have to write at university level. 
and why you created it. So that was an interesting topic and it's their first time with research and stuff like that. But marking like 40 of those improves your ability to write. My grammar improved. My, the thing that improved most was my ability to structure and develop a narrative. Mm. Um, and that was all from marking and teaching. Um, so if I had to think about similar things, it's because I've taught. So like, how can people do that in, a, um, in their own environment? And I just thought, well, there's three areas where you're going to be. You're going to be on your own uh, or you're going to be with someone where they can ask you questions or you could be with someone and then you can tell, um, explain something to them. So a lot of the original reading would come when you're on your own, you make doodles, but don't stop there. Then get into a situation, be in a group where you're with like-minded people where one, they might just, um, you know, just ask them to test you on basic uh, questions so that will give you like the base level knowledge help with memorizing stuff that you might need to then elaborate on other stuff uh, and then the piece de resistance is that last bit of the cake is going to come from teaching others mm -hmm. so I'm quite fortunate because of my job it allows me to do that um, but if you're working within a club you are even certain aspects I I speak to my wife like I try and explain certain things. If I'm struggling to understand something, I try and explain it to my wife. Uh, and that helps me. You know, everyone has that situation where they, they need to make a decision uh, and they're talking it out loud. And then as they're talking, they realize, okay, that's the decision. Like it's kind of that similar thing. Um, Cause you're like you're explaining it and they're like, Oh, I get it now. Just because you've said it out loud and having that soundboard or someone with you that will be able to do that. Um, I think is really um, a good opportunity. So that enables you to teach, but that doesn't, shouldn't necessarily stop there. Um, you know, you could, I know a lot of clubs or even gyms, which I think is great. They do like development lunch hours where each week another member of staff teaches uh, something. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is like perfect because one, you're learning the knowledge, but two, it's, it's enabling you to communicate. And that's half the battle sometimes. Um, so that's a really good opportunity. If you can create opportunities where you're going to teach someone else, then that's going to enhance your learning. So see it as that like three point stage on your own, reading, doodling, just come up with ideas and often write whatever's in your head. People often think, oh, I'm gonna, I need, oh, that doesn't make sense. I'm not going to write that down. Just write everything down. Then you go to a point where you might get someone to, to test you on basic information. And then thirdly, just find ways of teaching. Yeah. I and mean, that's the best way. Yeah. And, and your ability to create a narrative is really impressive. And back to that, what I opened with that, that lecture in St. Mary's where the narrative was was Walter, I think, wasn't it? But well, you had your, your bullet points, but you ended with your case study of Walter. Um, mm -hmm. I just think it was, it was really, really um, intelligent and witty and engaging. So hats off for you on that. Oh, thank you very much. I've, I've delivered that lecture one or two times and um, I, it's probably one of my favourite ones because it is about sort of learning and how I learn uh, and then me figuring out how to learn and it felt like if i can do that then so can everyone else um so you know if i can tell that in a story again hopefully people can resonate a bit more and then they find their own story then you know hopefully someone else will be able to create a similar presentation on their experiences yeah yeah uh no it was really good okay so we're, we're gone over the hour and I tried to keep them to an hour, Phil. It's been brilliant, right? I just have one question for you. And I, I guess, again, it's a little bit of a loaded question, but I was thinking, um, this popped into my head a couple of times throughout the conversation. Just if, if there was one thing in education that you could change, if you did have the power to change it, uh, what would it be? Oh, one thing. I'm wondering if that one thing would often change. <laughs> it might change depending on my mood or how I experienced that day. Um, I 
I mean, the one thing I'd want to change is everyone's perception of learning and what is necessary to learn. Because I think that's one thing that's, I think that's one thing that's behind S&C. Mm -hmm. I want, everyone talks about, oh, everyone learns at their own pace, but I don't want people to be penalized for that. Uh, so if I had to pick one thing, because I'm thinking like logistically or practically, how can I change one thing rather than, okay, the culture needs to change because that's quite a broad statement. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe, maybe it is that whole uh, strategy of getting rid of marks and then replacing it with uh, a kind of review on that person and their performance and various aspects throughout the module. I've probably got lecturers going, Phil, what are you talking about? That's going to take forever. And it might take longer, but I think it might also be necessary. Uh, if, I mean, what would be perfect if you had that situation and then you had a, a group of 25? Yeah. Like you would know everyone's names. Um, you know, you'd probably form a good relationship with each one. So you know how everyone learns and you can communicate better individually. And then on top of that, you had that strategy of not giving marks. It's more reflective and feedback based. I think that would really work. Um, however, money drives yeah. education a lot now and i think more so since um the uh, tuition fees went up because universities aren't getting funded by the the, the government are they yeah. um that's that's changed uh, the, the universities are becoming more and more like a business uh and they they want students um to to the point where you know universities fight for students because they want students um and I, I think that's wrong because i think education is something that shouldn't be fought over mm -hmm. um it should be given to those who want it yeah. and also not forced on anyone that doesn't want it and would rather, rather do something else uh, yeah i think i think we shone a big light on this especially well I, I don't know what the case in the uk is but in ireland anyway because this year because of the the whole coronavirus situation they couldn't complete the leaving cert okay mm. so which was the final exams so essentially you have students who went from first year to sixth year in second level education and there was really nothing tangible to be shown so there, there was really no way of grading them because of the fact that the exams didn't take place so then it asked the bigger question around surely there could be some way that you could reform that whole system so that whether it be continual education or assessment based education whatever it is so that at the end of their time you would never ever ever again be in this situation it's like that i remember again we were speaking about books before we went on air but i remember reading a book i think it's called the black box theory and it's based around uh, i don't know if you've read it before but i, I have a vague record is matthew syed sorry say that again is that matthew syed did he do black box thinking i, think I, I don't think i've read it but um... yeah I, I think it was actually yeah but basically where you know spoke about the aviation industry how when one plane came down, the whole industry got together and they realized that, okay, if this keeps happening, our industry is going to be crippled and we're all going to be out of work. So let's put, put together all our thinking, our collective thinking, and if there's ever a mistake or if there's ever a problem, if there was ever blame that we'll put our hand up, we'll deal with it, we'll get to the source of the problem and we'll eradicate the problem for the betterment of our industry going forward. And uh, yeah, I think that was the book, but... I often think that if we could collectively do that um, within, just think of the health system in Ireland at the moment, you know, instead of having the blame game, just being able to put your hand up and say, okay, this is what went wrong here, but let's put this right now so this never happens again. Then we could really drive the standards in, in that particular sector, you know. And I was just thinking that when it came to education, now at this moment in time, if we were to strip everything back and just Get really progressive collective thinking you know what would, could we change to improve the whole system hmm. I guess the approach I described could be implemented um, it's funny to hear that students are still getting grades but they're being given to them by their teachers um, which makes you think you know people are complaining it's like, well I'm a crammer so I've done really badly in my my prep uh, 
exams, but I usually do much better in the real exams. I was like, okay, that, that makes sense. So why do we need to have, um, <laughs> why do we need to have the grade there? Why don't we just allow the, the, the teachers to provide an honest account of that person's performance? Um, I mean, that usually if you get, if you had my strategy, they would have the performance in the, the exams to help with the discussion, but at least you're part of the way there and you're not, you're not providing a, a value that's subjective that could cause issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 It's, a big, it, it, it's a big question, but um, it's, that's, it, it's asking the big questions where we can um, progressively move forward, isn't it? Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah. It would be interesting to see what people have to say on, on these ideas that are presented in this podcast because you might have someone that completely disagrees for certain reasons. So, um, yeah, like uh, as is the that's 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 the way we want things. We we, you exactly. know, we want to throw out alternative um, alternative conversations and alternative points of view and outlooks because that's how we progress and that's how we move forward. Mm. You know. Phil, it has been a fantastic chat. We're on here um, between being on, on air and off air over two hours at this stage. So, um, yeah, in, it's been uh, great. Thank you very much. No, likewise. And um, again, uh, I wish you all the best in the future. We'll be crossing swords again in the next um, in, in, in the future months again. Yeah, certainly. Once uh, St. Mary's has their on site period again. 100%. Down. 100%. Well, thank you very much, my man. Thank you.